all of the attributes, I think, that is in our God and what we're supposed to feel is in that song, especially the, the way they sang it this morning. It's, it's really good. We, we appreciate that. I love to hear them sing. It's good to see everybody here this morning. We've got a few empty seats, but that's to be expected with it being a holiday. But we do thank all of you for being here this morning, our guests here today. We welcome you. If you would please stand and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read <laughs> verses 8 and 9 as our text verse this morning, uh, as our verses this morning. And then we're going to look at Romans chapter 14, verse 16. In Corinthians it says, He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and God's building. And Romans chapter 14 verse 16 says, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Amen. Father, we just thank you for our time here together. Father, we just ask that you bless this church and bless everyone who's here today. And Father, we just thank you for all of the blessings that you give us every day of our life. And Father, most of all, we ask today that you forgive us where we fail you. We ask that you be with us during this time. And Father, we just thank you for Jesus Christ that died on the cross, that we might have eternal life. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow is Labor Day. And this is going to be sort of a, sort of a Labor Day lesson for us here this morning. And you know, depending on what radio station you listen to or what TV uh, channel that you're watching, you're reminded, been reminded constantly of the fact that this is the Labor Day weekend. Everybody has a great opportunity for you to buy whatever it is you need at a huge discount this weekend and this weekend only. You can buy a car for thousands of dollars off. But the one thing that has really struck me this week as being the most ridiculous thing that I have heard in a long time is the fact that you can now buy a mattress and finance it for 96 months. I find that hard to believe that you would finance a mattress for eight years. I, anyway. That's free. That didn't cost you anything this morning. But if you also notice on the radio stations, they're telling you that the Highway Patrol will be out in full force this weekend trying to protect us from the people who are speeding and from the drunk drivers. We had a chance or uh, made an opportunity to go to Canton last Friday. They started last Friday. <laughs> there were Highway Patrols and police everywhere between here and Canton. When you think about Labor Day, you know, th th there, there's a reason for that. It gives people who labor an opportunity to rest. That'd be a good thing. But I, I'm not too familiar with most of the popular songs today. And, and I don't know if there are any work-related or Labor Day type songs like there used to be. Now, several generations ago, uh, a couple of generations ago, there were a lot of songs that were aimed around laboring. You know, some of us remember Tennessee Ernie Ford singing, uh, you load 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go because I owe my soul to the company store. Another one that I remember listening to on the radio when I was a kid was Frankie Lane singing, up in the morning, out on the job, work like the devil for my pay. But that lucky old son got nothing to do but roll around heaven all day. Anybody remember that song? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we all remember that song. And then there's a song by Jimmy Dean called Big John about the hazards and of working in a mine. And when I was a lot younger, there was one called Thunder Road. And if any of you remember that song, you know what that was about, right? Yeah, that was a guy running moonshine whiskey. <laughs> But they just don't make, oh, people still make moonshine whiskey, This, by the way. I didn't realize that, you know, that was a, still a viable entity 
or a, a way to make a lot of money, but you go south here down in the hill country, <clears throat> you can buy that stuff. Still pretty regular. But anyway, that's free too. That ain't cost anything. But then you people just really don't write those kind of songs anymore. Now, Labor Day is a special time for a lot of us for a lot of different reasons, but I guess the number one reason is the fact that it, we have something to do. Uh, so most of us, some of you still have jobs. Some of us don't. But, you know, we do have hobbies, and most of the time we have our grandkids to keep us busy. There was a story told several, <clears throat> several years ago about three brothers who had started working at the same place at the same time for this fur co company. One of these is feeding back at me here. <clears throat> And they had uh, went to work for this fur company who was owned by an old friend of their father. And after working there for more than a year, one of these boys was still receiving the same salary that he started with. The other one had, uh, and he seemed to be kind of unhappy with his job, but, and the other one had got a small raise. And the third son had received a very generous raise from the man. And curious about that, the father went to talk to his old buddy who was the president of the company, and he said, you know, I appreciate that you give all three of my boys a job and a position here at your company. He said, but I got a question for you. He said, you pay one of them $2,500 a month, you pay the other one $3,000 a month, and you pay the third son $5,000 a month. Why the difference in these boys' salary? Well, the president kind of leaned back in his chair, and he was quiet for just a minute, and he said, well, Maybe I can show you why. He said, do you have some time to spend here today? Father said, I can stay all day if I need to to find out what, what's going on with these boys. Well, the president of the company picked up the phone. He called the $2,500 a month boy, and he said, hey, he said, I know that the, the ship on to the Ontario has docked at the wharf, and they're loaded down with furs. He said, would you go down there and please see what cargo that they have on board? Well, about three minutes later, the president's phone rang, and he said, uh, this young fellow was on the other end. He says, I didn't have to go down there. He said, I called him on the telephone, and they have 1,500 seal skins on board. He said, thank you. Appreciate it. So he buzzed the next son, the $3,000 son. He told him basically the same thing. The Ontario has a docked, and it's got some furs on board. Would you go see about it? Well, about an hour later, the phone rang, and the son said, I went down there and checked, and sure, they have got, they've got 1,500 seal skins on board and some miscellaneous skins on board. He said, well, thank you very much. Then the president called the $5,000 a month son, told him basically the same thing, go down to the dock, check out these furs. <clears throat> well, about uh, four hours later, he, he shows back up at the president's office, and he says, well, I went down there and checked, and she did. She had 1,500 seal skins on board and they're all in good condition. I contracted to buy them for $25 a piece. Then I called our customer that was needing some seal skins and sold them all to him for $40 a piece. And he said they also had on board 500 red fox furs. He said, now I know we don't deal in that, but I knew this guy, I know this guy who wanted some, so I called him long distance and I made the sale, sold him the 500 fox, red fox furs he said, we're going to clear about $6,000 on that deal. He said, now, there were also 39 mink furs on board. And he said, I went in and examined them, and they're beautiful. He said, now, sir, I know you always like to talk to the president. He said, I know you always like to deal and handle the mink trade. So I took an option on these 39 furs until you could, till the end of the day. The president said, well, thank you. You did very well. He said, I'll check them out. So the young man left, and the, the president of the company turned to the father, and he said, has your question been answered? And the father said, yes. The first one didn't even follow your instructions. He said, the second one did exactly what you asked and nothing more. But the third one gave you his very best effort. And I want us, with that story in mind now, I want us to, to think about and listen to those words in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that we read a while ago. Each will be rewarded according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers. Now, if God means what he says, and he's going to reward us according to our labor, 
then we ought to ask ourselves this question, what am I worth to God? And I think the answer to that is going to depend on our answer to three other questions. One, which is how dedicated am I? In other words, the, look at the dedication of the three boys as they, they worked for this fur company. Do I work well with others? And the third question is how does God judge my worth? Now, I want you to know one thing right here. We're going to talk about our works today, but we all know that our salvation does not depend upon our works. Amen? All right. All right. Okay. Don't want anybody confused about that. But if you will go into and read the book of Revelation, it's going to be Revelation. I said Revelation, right? Okay. I think that we more, more, would more better understand, more better understand, the difference between works and salvation when we look at the book of Revelation. And, you know, you, James talks about it. First and second Peter talks about that. But I don't want anybody to be confused this morning that I'm saying that we got to have works to go to heaven. Because I give my life to Jesus Christ, and I have eternal life, and I have salvation if I don't hit another lick in my lifetime. But when I get to that judgment day and they open up, start opening up the books, I sure hope I have something good in those books. All right? Now then. So the first question is, how dedicated am I? Am I dedicated enough to keep me faithful when all of those around me are ignoring God's will and God's principles, and they're following the path of least resistance in their life? Romans chapter 14, verse 16 says, now, what we read a while ago, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. We need to pause right here and just think about those words and let those words this morning sink in. In your wildest dreams, did you ever think there would become a time when mentioning family values would be greeted with ridicule and with criticism? Or it's like when a high school football player gets injured. He's out on the field. A couple of his teammates, they kneel down in silent prayer for this kid while he's laying there being examined. Do you ever think that, can you imagine that anybody would threaten to sue the school because those two ball players knelt down and they prayed on the field? Did you ever think there would be a time when people who seek to save the life of an unborn baby would be laughed at and made fun of and be described as bigots? Or when public prayer or Bible reading would be prohibited almost anywhere in our society today. That's unbelievable. And those things that used to be considered good are now being called bad. And I'm really convinced, without a shadow of a doubt, that the devil rejoices at that. Right. You know, he twists these things that, that are good in God's sight and he tries to get society to condemn them as evil. And our society as a whole has swallowed his efforts hook, line, and sinker. Now, if you're a fisherman, you know that's a bad thing when they swallow it hook, line, and sinker. But in the light of all that, listen to what God told the people in Malachi's day. Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 and 17 says, you have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements? The evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. But then those who fear the Lord talk with each other, and the Lord listened, and he heard. And a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They, they will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possessions. Now those people that are talking about here who feared the Lord, they honored his name in Malachi's day, they remained faithful despite all of the ridicule and, the, and all of the, the 
sneers and stuff that were heaped on them because of what they were saying, or because of what they believed. And as a result of that, God called them my treasured possession. So they were truly worthy in God's sight for their belief. Now, <clears throat> how are we worthy today in God's sight? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, a man ought to examine himself. We talked about that last week. And when we examine ourselves, we need to realize that we need to dedicate ourselves on a daily basis to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The second question is, do I work well with others? Now, whenever I read Paul's words where he says, we are fellow God's fellow workers, I sometimes think of kind of the church is kind of like an assembly line. Now, I spent all my working life in a, in a machine shop and in a factory that had we made parts and assembled all of these parts. Uh, Joe can t tell you about that. And I think about maybe the church being kind of like an assembly line. There's so many things that can be accomplished when we work together that can never be done when we work alone. It's just like when we formed New Hope Church. We started remodeling this building. There's not one man that could have done all of this. It took the whole church body to make it happen. Now, <clears throat> the growth of the early church that's recorded in chapter 2 of Acts, it wasn't the result of just one man's preaching. They all had to work together. The entire group worked and they prayed together. <clears throat> and God blessed them for their efforts just like he has blessed the New Hope Church over the last four years. Now, in the last few verses of that chapter, in Acts chapter 2, notice how often the word together is used. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Together, working together, this country could accomplish a lot of things for God. There's just too many people working on their own at this point in time. There's going to have to be a major revival in the United States for us to continue. But they're working together. The book of Judges in chapter 7 to verses 20 and 21, they give a, an excellent example of the truth of working together. You know, well, we all know the story about Gideon and his faithful 300. You talk, remember, if you remember that he divided them, divided them into three groups of 100 men each. And he, at the critical time during the night, he placed 300 men, 100 on each of three sides of the Midian army. Every man carried a light in a pitcher and a trumpet. You remember at the given moment, they broke the pitchers, they blew the trumpets. And then all of them together shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And it says, then while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. The result of all of these people working together was a tremendous victory over an army that outnumbered them 20 to 1. <coughs> and I the church is going to have to, to continue to grow. We're going to have to work together. All of us are willing to do our part. Now, God has given us different talents and different abilities. And we need to use those talents and abilities to be witnesses for him through this church and through this community. There's a story that Teddy Roosevelt told years ago, and he had it in, in, a, in a book that he wrote. He told about a very interesting incident in his life, and he said, on the beautiful little island of Ismawarada, there were several hundred homes that belonged to people that uh, come to stay for the summer. And he said, I fell in love with that island and spent four summers up there. He said, I'd often heard of a salty old timer who lived up there and was called Uncle John by everybody on the island. 
And Uncle John apparently was such a character that he was a welcome guest in all of the prominent family homes there. Roosevelt says, once when I went to visit in one of these homes, I was asked if I had ever met Uncle John, and I told him no, but I'd been wanting to meet him. They said, well, hey, he's over here in the kitchen right now. Come on out here and meet Uncle John. Roosevelt says, they introduced us, and we liked each other right off, so we sat up and chatted for over an hour. He said, when I got up to leave, I held out my hand, and I said, Uncle John, I surely am glad I got to meet you, and if I can ever be of any help to you or do you a favor, I want you to feel free to call on me. Will you do that? And Uncle John answered, he said, I certainly will, Mr. President. He said, in fact, there's a, there's a request that I would like to ask of you right now, something that you can do, and I so wish that we'd do, you would do it. And then Uncle John smiled, and he said, look, and he pointed out the window, and up on the hill was a little white church up there. And he said, President Roosevelt, you're a Christian, but I haven't seen you up there at that church since you've been on this island. <coughs> he said... <coughs> If you, the President of the United States, would come up there to church, all the people on the island would flock up there. And do you want them to go to church? Don't you think they need to go to church? And Roosevelt said, he said, I hung my head in shame and told him I'll be there Sunday. And sure enough, on Sunday morning, there was standing room only in that church. And he said, I never missed another Sunday in that little white church while I was there. He said, I was ashamed of myself before my Heavenly Father that I had been such a poor witness for him. So God's church should and will be made up of faithful witnesses for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All of us working together, we can further his kingdom beyond all belief in our time today. So the third question is, how does God judge my worth? Now I'm sure that, that most of us who earnestly try to be good Christians are sometimes going to be discouraged by things that happen, circumstances in our life. And we're going to think that we're failures and that we're not worth much to God. But there's a passage in the Old Testament that we should remember, and I'm sure all of you do, that's when God sent Samuel to Bethlehem to anoint a king. Now Samuel asked Jesse to have all of his sons parade in front of him and that the Lord would pick one of his sons to be the king. Well, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 and 7 says, When they arrived, Samuel saw Elab and thought, Surely the Lord anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at, Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, <clears throat> we may be worth a little bit more than we realize. And I'm glad that God looks at our hearts, that he really knows us and he no loves us for what's in our hearts this morning. You know, a preacher told about something that happened on a, a Sunday evening service. And it was a kind of rather informal service, kind of like we have here at New Hope Church on Sunday night. And he said, does anybody have anything to say? Well, there was a, a visitor at the back, a rather dignified gentleman. He stood up and he said, yes, sir, I'd like to say something. He said, this is the first time that I've been back in this church in 35 years. He said, I attended Sunday school in my grade school days and and I see here tonight my old Sunday school teacher, Mr. Alton, and he turned to face Mr. Alton. Mr. Alton's eyes opened wide, and he looked at this stranger, and then he asked, Mr. Alton, do you remember me? He said, my name's Hurley. After a moment or two, then a smile kind of came over Mr. Alton's face, and he said, it's been a long time, Hurley. He said, I kind of, kind of getting old, my eyesight's getting bad, but it's good to see you. And the visitor went on to say, Mr. Alton, I want to tell you something that I think will make you happy this morning. He said, I traveled a long way to talk to you and to ask for your forgiveness this morning or today. He said, we were the meanest boys that there ever were in Sunday school, and we gave you all kinds of trouble, and I guess I was pretty much the ringleader in most of the mischief that went on here. He said, but on the Sunday before my parents and my family moved away, he said, I was particularly obnoxious that day 
And he said, after leaving class, I remembered something that I had left behind, and I decided that I'd better get it since it was going to be my last day here at this church. He said, so I went back and I looked in the door. He said, I saw you seated up front with your head bowed, and it sounded like you were crying. He said, I heard you say, and I heard you pray, oh, Lord, please help me. So Mr. Alton, he said, I've stayed. I'm still very still. I stayed very still there for a long time listening to you pray, and then I slipped away. He said, for five years, I heard inside whenever I thought of you sitting there praying that morning. He said, one day it occurred to me that I was on the wrong side of the Lord and that I'd been on the wrong side for all my life. He said, I'd upset the class, I'd upset the Sunday school, and I'd upset everything else, and it made me pretty miserable. He said, but finally I gave my heart to God. He said, today I'm an elder in my church. He said, thanks to that prayer that you prayed that day, I've been thanking God for you for many years. And now I've come tonight to say that I'm sorry for my behavior back then, and I've come to thank you for your prayers and all that you have done for me. So how about you this morning? Where do you stand with God? If you're not a Christian, then Jesus is willing and ready to receive you this morning. If you'll come this morning and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as we stand and sing hymn number 480 is our invitation today. So as we, as we sing, you come.